All right, so revenue management, jumping right into chapter one of the book. Some of the stuff we've already talked about, this is kind of just a, again, a kind of a big overview of what revenue management is. Chapter two is where we start doing those calculations like ADR, RevPAR, and whatnot, okay? So revenue management started in the airline industry. After the airline industry was deregulated back in the 70s, I believe, um, now people could come into the airline market, they could offer cheaper rates, they could be a little bit more competitive, um, and revenue management um, is essentially managing our revenue. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> revenue management is essentially just taking um, this product that we have and we want to maximize the revenue that we can get from it, okay, uh, from that product. So we're going to manage our rate. We all know that hotels don't have the same rate every single day for the same room, okay? Sometimes even in the same day, the rate can change. Mm -hmm. So as occupancy, someone might call and say, make a reservation for next Friday. And I take the reservation, I look at my computer system, and that rate will be 109 for tonight, or for that night. Okay, great, go ahead and book me for the weekend. And then somebody else calls, yep, it's 109. And then about two hours later, we've had some more online uh, reservations made. And about two days late, two, uh, two hours later, you look on the reservation, it's like, wait, our rate is now 115. You just told two people before it was 109. Do you call them back and be like, I'm so sorry, just kidding. Yeah, it's gonna be six dollars more, you, you know? Order. They only went up because they reserved it that day. Right? They it went up because the occupancy was increasing. So the concept of supply and demand. If there's now all of a sudden our revenue management, either, either a person or an automated revenue management system, part of our property management system, um, is realizing that there's demand on that day. So my supply is getting smaller and there's demand, I'm going to drive my price up. Okay. So we change our, our rates. The revenue streams, where in our hotels do we get revenue? Everywhere that sells something. Food and beverage. What are what we, we usually call them outlets? So what are some outlets in the hotels? Banquets, spa, golf, food and beverage. The gift shops. The gift shops. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can manage where all that revenue is coming from. That's why sometimes, not always, but that's why sometimes groups can ask for a lower rate than the the regular rate. Because we're, sh yeah, absolutely. We can give you $20 off our room rate. However, I need you to spend $25,000 in food and beverage minimum, okay? <laughs> so I need to spend $25,000 minimum on food and beverage and I can discount your rate because this revenue stream means I'm gonna get that money somewhere else, okay? Distribution channel management. How do we manage where we get our rooms from? What is the most ideal way for people to book our hotel rooms? Oh, direct. direct, okay? It can be online direct with our website, okay? But directly is the ideal way for people to book our rooms. Why? They pay that rate. They don't have to pay a rate. Exactly. They pay that rate and we get 100% of that revenue. We don't have to pay a percentage or a commission to a third party. And so it's ideal. But are third parties a part of life? Yeah. Absolutely, right? They're a necessary evil. Probably shouldn't say that on the video, but um, hopefully nobody from Expedia is listening. <laughs> Just um, but they are. They're a necessary evil because so many customers and so many guests are accustomed. When I'm looking for a hotel room, where's the first place I'm going to type in? Expedia or Orbit or Hotwire cheap or Kayak. Chi yeah, cheap hotel rooms. Well, what's going to come up is all those different sites. Okay. I usually just go to the website. Like, I mean, I don't stay at, at Marriott or anything like that, like name, but I, I'll stay like at a Motel 6 or something. Right. Like, you know, but it, I'll usually just go like Motel 6 and reserve directly through them. Yeah. I, I, I did that. My cousin did that um, third party thing. And when we got, when I got to Georgia to go pick her up, she, like, it was a total mess. Like, no, we can't do that much. Like, this is the price she paid through this website, and they wanted to charge me literally, like, almost 50 bucks more. I said, no, nope, I will go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, yes, ma'am. But not only that, like, when you do look up a hotel, the first two things that pop up on that Google is the Expedia and the hotel. 
Mm -hmm. And then all the prices are at the bottom. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, but it's dot com. It's so bad. It says like Lock and Tara Resort and everything, but it's actually the website is reservations dot com. So people are like, I booked directly with this exactly how I did it. And it's like, look at the URL though. It's not yeah. Lock and Tara Resort dot com. No. <laughs> um, on on hers, uh, when I look up like that, it comes out like you said, Expedia or or Travelocity or whatever you know. But it says add and small little square it says add. Yep. So usually when it says add, I, I just bypass that. I'm like, nope, I'm going directly to the website. So um, so I mean another thing too, like the average. The average guest doesn't understand no. that Expedia owns Trivago, that Expedia owns Hotwire, right? It's all the same company. And so the average guest doesn't understand. Um, of course, we also want to make sure that our rates mirror each other, mm -hmm. okay? Except for on places like Hotwire because um, those are opaque sites, meaning we can't see what I'm booking until I've actually paid for my room. And then you get an email and say, you're staying at this hotel, okay? <laughs> Some of y'all might like to do the hotel roulette. I do not. I like to know exactly where I'm staying because um, you don't know. I mean, there's so many hotels downtown San Antonio that have Riverwalk in their name. And there's some, there's, there was one downtown, it's an independent hotel, but it was like Riverwalk Convention Center Alamo. And it wasn't close to any of those three things, but it had all three things in its name. So the average, you know, a person who, who is traveling, they're like, oh, I'm not, I'm not in any, anywhere near any of these places, you know? And so that distribution channel management, we'll talk about that as well. So some features of revenue management, we want to define what our product is, okay? So for us, it, what's our product primarily? Rooms. Rooms, okay? And so we want to define what our product is, um, and that revenue management is also, you know, based on, um, as, we're, as we're figuring out, like, where our hotel rooms are in, within our property. So are they river view rooms? Are they city view rooms? Are they junior suites? Are what types, you know, so we want to know what our products are to be able to set those rates, okay? Um, competitive benchmarking, strategic pricing, demand forecasting. So these are all things we're going to talk about in more, in more in depth throughout the semester. Um, that business mix, how many of y'all, any of y'all work in sales or have worked in sales, okay, in hotels? Um, what about... Trying to think, because like sometimes a salesperson will go to the revenue manager and be like, I really want to take this group. The revenue manager is like, no, we can't take that group because we're looking at a, a mix of leisure and group, right? I really want to take this group. Well, if we take this group, that's going to displace some of our potential leisure travelers, mm -hmm. okay? And so we'll do, there's one chapter on displacement analysis, and we'll actually, we'll actually look into that. Um, and then again, that dist distribution channel management. So these are all things that we're going to be looking at. Um, when it comes to revenue management. Um, let's see, occupancy, we've gone over the rates. So our rack rate, which we'll talk about a variety of different types of rates, but our rack rate is ideally what we want to get for that room, okay? Discounts, we want to know when discounts are appropriate, when, we're, when we should be taking discounts, when we should not be taking discounts. When is the time, Alfred, do you think that we should not take any discounts? Mm -hmm. During Fiesta. That's a perfect one. That's a perfect one, during Fiesta. Okay, so let me give you a good example of that. When I was working at the La Quinta, um, HEB corporate office is right across the street from the La Quinta where I worked. And so we had an $85 HEB rate, okay? And anybody could get the $85 rate. They had to show their, their HEB name tag and their um, most recent pay stub, and they get an $85 rate. They could be the, the shelf stalker at the local HEB, or they could be the CEO of HEB, and they get the $85 rate. Okay, that was part of that, con that corporate contract. Now, primarily, people that used it were people that were, were coming in to be at the corporate office for a week, right? But, um, so... There was one day, and this is before I got real involved with Fiesta. I mean, I knew what it was. I knew that we got Friday off in, in high school. Um, we went to the parade maybe once or twice. It was not like a tradition in my family, um, unless somebody was marching in the parade, like in the band. Um, and then we just all got dragged along. But um, 
So I don't know, didn't really know what this fiesta was, but I knew, I, I didn't actually know, take that back. I had no idea what fiesta was, what it was all about. And so these people called, and I got the HEB rate for this particular weekend, just happened to be the second weekend of fiesta. That's the busy weekend with all the parades. And they asked for the HEB rate, $85 rate. And of course, me not knowing anything about Fiesta, I was like, absolutely, let me take the reservation for you. So I fill it in. They take the Literally 30 seconds after I hang up, I want to get a book. I want to get a room for this rate, the HEB rate on this date. Okay, great. Let's do that. Let me take care of this. I'm, like, I'm, a, I'm an expert at taking reservations now. I know how to do this. I can manage this. Third call in like less than two and a half minutes. Fifth call. I'm like, wow, what is going on on this date? And I looked, and our rate was $2.99 for that day. And our revenue manager had forgotten to close the discount. We can close discounts, okay? Um, unless it's like written into the corporate contract that it's always available, no blackout dates, we will close that, con we'll close that discount. And so finally, like the 10th person called me. And they said, well, my friend just called and they got $85 rate. And I said, they absolutely did. But right <laughs> now, because of our occupancy level, we no longer are offering that discounted rate. So the rate is $299. Well, I want the $85 rate. I'm sure you would appreciate the $85 rate, but unfortunately, I'm not able to Those overwrite are, that. Are, are, that rate is all taken with. care of, yeah. you know? And so I'm like, and then, of course, these are things you say, you, you think in your head that you don't actually say out loud. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. You're going to put 10 people in that room anyway. So charge each of them 30 bucks and you'll cover your 200 dollars 29 range. Like, be done with it. Um, it's the same with group walks, too. Like, we'll contract X amount of rooms. And if somebody tries to book outside of the group but they're with the company, we don't let them book at that group block. Absolutely. Book at bar. Exactly. And if the group fills. Mm -hmm. I mean, so so traditionally, um, we don't as a as a as a, somebody in like that that works in groups and sales, you know, we don't want to tie up too much of our inventory with groups. And so or and so there is a is anybody not familiar with the term attrition? I've heard it. Okay, so attrition, how you've heard of it. But attrition essentially is when a group does not fill their whole group block, right? So if a group says, I'm going to fill 100 rooms, and they've only filled 80, attrition is they have to pay for those 20 rooms, whether they're filled or not, okay? And so if a meeting planner starts having to pay attrition for their conferences because people, A, don't show up, or people um, say they're going to be there and they don't, or they just don't fill the room block, then they might start lowering that room block. And just say, you know what, this this year I'm not paying the hundred, I'm not paying the twenty dollar or the twenty twenty room attrition. I'm just gonna go from the start at eighty rooms. Well, now people are like, I'm gonna go. I'm so sorry that room block is full, you know. And so now here's the rate that's available. Okay. So yeah, definitely. What is our you know our sale? Um, when are we gonna discount those those things? Sales mix that kind of talks about well, how much food and beverage, how much spa. How much, um, you know, so J JW Marriott um, has Knibby Ranch, I believe, as like an off-site venue. And I worked for a ranch, and oftentimes we would lose business to Knibby Ranch because whatever money was spent by that client at Knibby Ranch went towards their food and beverage minimum at the JW Marriott. Oh, wow. So their, their, their food and beverage minimum is... X of thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. Why are you going to come over to this other ranch and pay an additional ten to fifteen, twenty thousand dollars when you can use that towards your food and beverage minimum, right? So we always lost a lot of business to them. Plus, it's closer um, to the JW. But so, what else is being sold um, so we can manage and figure out what rate can we sell? Okay, um, who's buying it? And again, of course, our distribution channels are coming up. So the airline industry started revenue management, but these other industries realized our products are all similar. The biggest thing is that our products are perishable. What does perishable mean? It expires. They don't last. What is that? They go away. Yeah, they go away. Okay. Once that airplane takes off, 
We can't just drop someone in that seat midair, okay? Um, not yet, anyways. I'm sure the technology's coming. Star Trek is, wasn't too far off. Um, but, you know, once we, once we do that, that, that product is gone, okay? Um, once the cruise leaves the harbor, we can't put somebody on that boat. Um, and so same thing with car rentals. So all of these are places that it's like, you know, we've got to sell our product. If we don't, it expires. So that is one of the key, key characteristics um, of being able to use and uh, utilize revenue management is that your product is very perishable. <clears throat> technology has changed. How has technology changed in the hospitality industry? You can check in on your phone. You can check in on your phone. Can Absolutely. You can, use your key. Mm -hmm. you can use your phone as your key. How many of you have ever seen that? How many of you have never seen using your phone as a key? I saw it on the commercial. It's awesome. I saw it on the it, commercial. It really is. I used to think that that's not like, such a great thing, but now I think it's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, Hilton was the one who kind of spearheaded that, and now other other companies are, are jumping on board. At the JFK airline, there's a, they like made a section of a hotel that's out of an airplane, and you make your own key out of the kiosk. Like there's like keys and you like sign in, check in, whatever, and then it like blinks just like how you know your normal key maker works, but yeah. it's attached to a kiosk and you just make your own key. And you, you wow. Like wow. 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 Yeah. Um, it's taking away the face to face and having to take that time to go to the front desk and stuff like that. It does, absolutely. Now I personally still go to the front desk because I want to get a key. I mean, what happens if I leave and my phone dies? Mm -hmm. You know? And uh and I can't get back into my room. So I typically will stop by, especially if I'm staying at a double tree, because I want to make sure I get my cookies. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to skip those warm cookies. Um, so I'll always stop at the front desk uh, to get an extra key. But, uh, but sometimes, so this was interesting, kind of random story. Um, I was at a hotel in Dallas. At the time I was um, silver level on the Hilton Honors and um, I couldn't check in online through the app, I had to stop by the front desk. And I thought, well, that's weird. That's never happened before. So I went and asked the guy, I mean, I was like, why, why do I have to stop at the front desk? I wasn't upset, I was just kind of curious. And he said, oh, we've had a lot of issues with fraud. And I was like, okay, first of all, you probably shouldn't admit that you have a lot of issues with fraud to a random guest. Second, um, he explained that, uh, you know, with the Hilton Honors, oftentimes there's a promotion when you sign up, you automatically get silver um, silver status, um, and people would 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 um, connect false credit cards or stolen credit card numbers to their Hilton Hilton Honors account. They would use the digital key, check in the room, and because there was never a physical swipe of the card, they would never know that the card was stolen or not good information until they went to run and process that card. And so anybody who was silver or blue was required to stop at the front desk to do a physical swipe of their card. Anybody who was gold or di or platinum or diamond or whatever it is, it, I'm not there yet. Um, <laughs> gold is the highest I've ever reached. Um, but everyone who was gold and, and platinum, at that point, they're probably those types of guests. They're probably not using stolen credit cards, right? They've done enough that they're probably not using stolen credit card numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought that was really interesting. I was like, great, I'm gonna talk about this in my class. Yeah. But you shouldn't tell people you have issues with fraud. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. all right. <laughs> um, so different changes. Um, it used to be that like the people who owned the hotel ran the hotel, and now you have owners, you have asset managers, you have um, management companies, uh, and, and sometimes management companies off, like manage different brands. So Baywood um, is a management company here, and they have hotels here in San Antonio. Um, I believe they do IHG, Inter Intercontinental Hotel Groups. Um, they do Hilton, and I believe Marriott as well. So they manage three different types of different brands of hotels. Um, they just opened most recently the True and Home 2 combination, which is out on 151. So if you're going out towards SeaWorld, on the left-hand side, you'll see this big hotel where it's True on one side and Home 2 on the other. Um, and so they just opened that hotel not too long ago. Um, that's also something that, that's coming up that's been more and more um, 
that is common like lately sure. is having, you know, having like dual, dual properties. Yeah. I actually, I was in New York with my sister and there was a triple property. So there was one entrance to the lobby, but it was three completely different brands. I think they were all Marriott brands, but they were all com three completely different brands. Mm -hmm. But there was one lobby, one entrance, main entrance, and then you just went off into the different places. Um, so, yeah. Markets are more segmented than ever, okay? Mm -hmm. It used to be that you had those families traveling and you had business travelers. Um, but now you have lifestyle hotels and you have luxury boutique hotels, you have historic hotels, and you have all these people, the, these different markets that all want something different. Mm -hmm. I mean, the last time I left my phone in my office, but the last time I opened my Hilton Honors app, there was brands that I did not even recognize. And I was like, oh, what's that? I need to look into that. Um, San Antonio, right now under construction, is a Curio and a Canopy through by Hilton. Um, and then the El Tropicana Hotel is in the process of being renovated. It was just purchased, or the, the Phoenix Hospitality Group took that over. Um, and they're in the process of transitioning it into a tapestry collection by Hilton. So those are like their, their, their luxury boutique hotels. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the, the hotel industry is changing um, and it's changing very quickly. Also, the guest has more access to our information than they ever did before. Mm -hmm. Think about the time before, before I was gonna say before technology, but that's that's kind of ridiculous. Um, a time before, like like with telephones, you had to call the hotel, and you know get get a rate. Um, before that, you could write the hotel and get a rate for your, to let them know you're coming on this particular day. Um, and so now that, I mean, there was one time I uh, was in a movie theater, I was watching the previews, something sparked my memory that I had to go to Austin for a crawfish boil. And I was like, oh, I need a room to stay. Mm -hmm. And before that preview was done, I had my room booked. Um, I mean, it just happens so quickly now. So things are, things are happening and changing. So criteria for revenue management, we talked about um, perishable products. But fixed capacity is the other one. What does that sound like? Fixed capacity. There's only a certain amount that you can get. Yeah. Can I go out and build five extra hotel rooms if I need it? Nope. No, I can't do that. So I've got a thousand rooms. I have 200 rooms. I have a specific capacity. I can't just put three more people on a plane, although they're trying to make those seats so small. Um, <laughs> but. I can't just put three people on a plane and say, hey, how about you just stand in the aisles? Um, just hold on here and you'll be good. Okay. <laughs> no, that's a fixed <laughs> capacity. So we can't, that's, we can't just add. So that's part of the criteria of effective um, revenue management. That the just domain, me the what's bus. that? That just reminded me of the city bus. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, they don't take off at massive speeds <laughs> and land. Um, they're very, but they have a predictable demand. So Alfred mentioned Fiesta. What other types of spring things break. do we have? So spring break. Final Four when they came. Yeah, when Final Four came. That was a huge thing. The river lighting, the day after Thanksgiving, absolutely. Um, what happens between Christmas and New Year's? There's a big event that happens downtown. Alamo. The Villa Alamo Bowl. Okay, so that Alamo Bowl was actually, from what I understand through conversations with other people, that Alamo Bowl was created as a demand generator. So typically, between Christmas and New Year's, it was very slow. We didn't have a lot of demand. So they brought the Valero, the Valero Alamo Bowl as one of the college bowl games to San Antonio. Back then, it was like the Builder Square. So it wasn't, hasn't always been Valero, but they, bought, they brought the Alamo Bowl to San Antonio for the sole purpose of driving demand and increasing demand during Christmas and New Year's during a time of period that was traditionally very slow for hotels Is and that hospitality. Why it's the because it's here? Yeah, because it's here in San Antonio. Yep. Yeah. So so we can do things. We have ideas of when it's gonna be somewhat predictable in what when you know, rodeo month is coming up um so february is rodeo march is spring break april is fiesta and then we go right into summer san antonio is really fortunate because you know we have 
a pretty good mix of leisure and business travel. Um, we have high fixed costs, but low variable costs. Okay, so we have to pay the mortgage on our hotel. However, our low variable costs, our variable costs, if I don't sell this hotel room, I don't incur a lot of costs. So variable costs are only if I sell that hotel room. So what's something that might be a hotel, uh, variable cost for a hotel? Not a smoking, not a smoking fee, but like think about like if I sell that room, then it's going to cost me to get that room ready again for somebody else. So the water, the labor. Okay, so labor. So yeah, the the soaps, the shampoos, um, all the amenities in the room, the coffee, um, all of those things. The, the washing the linens, the labor to do all of that. Those are variable costs and those, depending on the hotel you're at, can be relatively low. Um, so oftentimes people are like, oh, well, they'll try to come to your hotel front desk and it's midnight mm -hmm. and they're like, I know you want to sell this room, so I need it for $25. They're like, why are people do that? No, yeah. I'm so sorry. Like uh, my best available rate is, $75. I know, but you really need someone to stay in that room. If you don't sell it, then you can't, you're not gonna get that money back. And it's like, great. But what the guest doesn't understand is it cost me $15, $20 to redo that room. And so you're telling me that you, you want me to put you in that room and I'm gonna get $5 of revenue off of that? $5? No. Like, I'm sorry, uh, my rate is, my best available rate is this. I've had that at the La Quinta, they're like, oh, I know, but you got to get somebody in that room. I said, no, actually, I don't. Um, <laughs> this is the lowest rate I'm, I'm, I'm allowed to go. And they're like, are you sure? Yes. Okay, I'll take that rate. <laughs> I was like, absolutely, you'll take that, right? <laughs> or you can go find a different hotel. Of course, you don't. Those are things you don't say out loud. You keep them in your mind, right? But same thing. I mean, people will do it um, all the time at like a concert. So they're like, oh, they got to sell that seat. Otherwise, you know, so I'm going to wait till the last minute to go and buy my seat. <laughs> you ain't going to guarantee okay. that seat. Yeah. That's so we have high fixed costs, meaning that like, all like our salaries, all of our like late, um, our mortgage on the building, all of our, our payments, things like that. Those are relatively high, but our low, our low uh, variable costs um, are relatively low. So with these four things in place, then we can start looking at our effective revenue management. We talked about all these already. Look at that. Mm -hmm. All right, so cost structure. <clears throat> we talked about that. Challenges. Challenges to the room and stuff. Okay, um, so challenges of revenue management. One of the biggest things is should it be centrally located or should you have somebody um, that can oversee pro manage, uh, revenue management over multiple properties, kind of like at a regional level, okay? So with technology now, it's a lot easier to be able to manage that. I know, I think the revenue management team for the Marriott's, they manage the two Marriott's downtown and the JW Marriott, I believe. Yeah. Uh, so they manage the revenue for, the, they do revenue management and the, the rate setting for all three properties. Um, and so there is um, so much data that um, is being processed uh that how do we determine what data to look at how do we determine um what data is important and revenue management is still relatively new i mean it's getting older as the years go on but it's probably one of the newest um segments of the hospitality industry as far as careers and so um People are getting, I think, I, I always felt like if I were to go back into the industry, revenue management would be an uh, area that I would love to go into. I love looking at patterns. I love looking at numbers, of course, but I, I like the numbers, the patterns. I like to put the pieces of the puzzle together, all of that stuff. Um, and so if you can get, if that's something that you're interested in, I would highly recommend that you start you know, talking to your revenue manager at your property and just you know talk to them and say, can I shadow you? We're learning about this in class. How do you use this in, in your, your line of work now? 
Um, so just think about that. Um, tactical and strategic. So we'll go over both types. Okay. So strategic is long term. Think of the word strategy. So strategic is long term. Tactical is what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. So, oh my gosh, next week we are not at the occup occupancy percentage that we need to be at um, based on what we projected and we forecasted. So do I now drop my rate? And if I drop my rate, how far can I go? Because that's tactical. That's reactive. Okay. Strategic um, is planning for the future. Okay. Um, social media is also a big thing about, you know, do I use ads on social media? Do I, um, how do I utilize social media to get um, information about our hotel out there? Um, and that's that kind of where it comes into as part of the marketing side of it and working with. So revenue managers work with the marketing, the sales, the front office, the rooms division. They work with it all. Um, and mobile devices. We kind of talked about that already. Like mobile devices, you can do so much with your phone. Um, it used to be that the biggest concern was making your web page mobile friendly. Mm -hmm. How many of you love to like pinch and like expand a website so you can read it? Yeah. Nobody loves to do that. And so it used to be that whatever's on the website on your laptop and your computer um, was the same thing you would see on your phone. But now there has to be two different versions. There has to be a mobile friendly version. And what can, I mean, I personally sometimes will like find that little link that says view the full site because I want to see what's happening on the actual site. Okay. Um, cause sometimes the things you can do on the mobile site or on the Let computer, you, you can't do on the mobile Let site. The okay. So it kind of goes, there's give and take there, but how do we harness the power of mobile devices? Somebody told me, um, that, uh, <coughs> visit San Antonio was running a, probably should have put this on. I also did, uh, one of my classes that I took, um, at, through grad school. We had to do an exercise on Google Analytics. Has anybody heard of Google Analytics? So there's like so there's a way that you know we used to when I was a, when I was a student and a practicum student at the La Quinta. One of my responsibilities was to get on orbits and see where my hotel ranked in the order of all the hotels, right? And so if you're on page two, you might not get looked at. If you're on page three, you're definitely not getting looked at. And so that's we were like the optimization. We were looking, we were looking for that. But Google Analytics was mind blowing to me when it basically is able to tell where you're clicking. So if I clicked their ad on Facebook, then it would tell me, it would tell the company that I came to their um, their website through social media or I type their website in directly. So same thing with hotels, right? Did I book direct or did it come from a third party? And so um, it tells you how long you spend on each website, on each web page within their website. It tells you where your customers leave your website. So at which page do they decide to close your website and move on? <laughs> yeah, the price. <laughs> it's like, nope, just kidding. Um, <laughs> What um, it tells them, it tell it, it can tell you a multitude of everything, and I was just like, oh my gosh, this is crazy! That all of this information is is here, and that's what we talk about. You know, this enormous amount of data. Um, think about we use key cards, so every time we open a door, that transaction is recorded. So we can go back and the guest says, oh my gosh, the housekeeper stole my blah, 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 whatever. And you go back and look at the system and like your housekeeper hasn't, hasn't even been in your room. The last person to access your room was you. Of course, you don't use that um, condescending tone. <laughs> Ask Lily, sir, let me look into that for you. I'll be right back. Okay. Um, and so, but like, I mean, you can tell how many people are using your pool. How many people use your fitness center? If your fitness center use is dropping, well, is it because you have corporate people in-house that aren't using it? 
Or do you have corporate people in house and they're not using it because your fitness center sucks and the equipment is old and outdated. So maybe in your next improvement plan, you need to, you need to include a budget for redoing the fitness center. I mean, so there's all these, this, all this data is just coming at us. So how do we manage that? How do we interpret all of that? Um, so the hotel industry in general is changing and technology has a huge, plays a huge role in that. Um, questions, comments, concerns? About that. All right.